Max's journey into the pharmaceutical world had started as a reluctant legacy. His father, a meticulous and visionary chemist, had established their family company with little more than ambition and a garage lab decades earlier. Over time, his father crafted a niche for the business, creating rare but essential medications, a venture that turned modest profits but failed to break into mainstream success. Max, along with his siblings, inherited the reins after their father's end of life, bound not just by legal obligation, but by a sense of familial loyalty. Balancing his career with the demands of a growing family, Max had worked tirelessly to maintain the business. Yet, as the years went on, the weight of responsibility became burdensome. With his daughters now attending college and his marriage entering a phase of quiet predictability, he decided it was time to let go. Selling the company to a larger corporation seemed not only a logical move, but also a path to personal freedom. Max sat in the bustling terminal at New York's airport, frustrated at how his evening had turned out. His eyes lingered on travelers hurrying toward their gates, boarding the flight he prayed would bring him back to Charlotte. The past few days had been a whirlwind, wrapping up negotiations to sell the family pharmaceutical business alongside his sisters. The company, though founded on his late father's ingenuity, had stagnated over the years. Their decision to sell was bittersweet but necessary, driven by a mix of nostalgia and the lure of new opportunities. Today, Max and his legal and brokerage team had wrapped up the deal and left the paperwork to the lawyers. He was hoping to catch the last flight home, but things weren't looking good. It was fully booked, and he was third on the wait list. He didn't call his wife, Camilla, because he wasn't sure what to say. Max sat at the bar with his second gin and tonic, watching the gate and thinking about the deal. The sale would bring him over $10 million, plus a well-compensated transition period with Big Pharma meaning a new lifestyle for him and Camilla. Their twin daughters were already out of the house, or at least on their way. Both were juniors at Duke, and their tuition was draining Max's wallet, but all of that would change once the deal went through. The boarding process was almost over, and the gate agents were calling the last few passengers. Then, a small miracle happened. The sign at the gate changed, and Max's name appeared on the wait list. He threw money on the bar, waved to the bartender who gave him a thumbs up, grabbed his briefcase and duffel bag, and rushed for the gate. The agent handed him his boarding pass, explaining that a group of four who had checked in remotely hadn't shown up, so the seats were reassigned to waitlisted passengers. Max hurried down the jetway with two other passengers, and when he boarded, he realized he had been given a first-class seat. A good sign, he thought. I made it onto the flight. I'm in first class. I'll be home a day early. Maybe this means the pharmaceutical deal is really happening. As the door closed behind him, the flight attendant asked, Would you like something to drink as we taxi to the runway? I'll take another gin and tonic, Max replied. He felt he deserved it, so he drank it quickly before settling into his seat and falling asleep, dreaming of a future with Camilla that would always include first-class flights. The jolt of landing woke him up. He made his way to the taxi stand, exhausted and a little tipsy, not wanting to bother Camilla at this late hour. They lived a few miles outside of Charlotte, so the cab ride was long enough for Max to drift back to sleep. The driver had to wake him when they arrived. Max paid, added a generous tip, and slowly got out of the taxi, his body heavy from the long day. As he walked toward the house, already looking forward to settling in next to Camilla in bed, something caught his eye that stopped him cold. A gold Mercedes was parked in the driveway, right in front of his side of the garage. It looked like a very stylish Mercedes, Though to Max, all Mercedes seemed stylish. The house was dark by then, past midnight, and Max stood frozen for several minutes. He had spoken to Camilla earlier that day around noon, and she hadn't mentioned any late-night visitors. He tried to push away any bad thoughts, hoping to come up with some explanation that would let him crawl into bed beside a warm, sleepy Camilla, but his mind wouldn't let go. Slowly, he walked to the door between the garage and the house, unlocked it, and stepped inside the quiet home. He moved cautiously through the kitchen up the stairs to their bedroom. The door was open as if no one was expecting company and Max entered. And then it hit him. Hit. He couldn't even process what he saw. His mind froze. His breath caught in his chest. His heart seemed to stop. Camilla was lying unclothed on her side of the bed, her arm wrapped around a man who was also asleep, a small smile on his face. Max stood there for what felt like an eternity. Eventually, his brain started functioning again. He looked at Camilla's hand resting on the man's chest, both of them snoring softly. 
The pain of it hit him like a physical blow. Until that moment, he had always found comfort in Camilla's gentle snoring. It was soft, almost like a purr, and it made him feel safe, like they were sharing something deeply intimate and secure. But now, that sound was nothing more than a reminder of everything he had lost. Even in his heartbreak, Max's mind started working again. He noticed the man's clothes neatly folded on the chair Max had sat in hundreds of times. A surge of rage started to bubble up inside him. Max adjusted his pants, pulled out his wallet and car keys, and paused for a moment to think. Max considered grabbing the tennis racket from the bedroom closet and using it to teach the fool. He also thought about taking his anger out on Camilla. While both actions might offer some temporary satisfaction, he knew they could create major problems for him down the road. A new idea began to form. He pulled out his cell phone to snap a few incriminating photos. As the thought developed, Max finished taking the pictures, then grabbed all of Franklin's clothes and shoes. Franklin was a big guy, at least four or five inches taller than Max and maybe 50 pounds heavier. Max was 5'10", and weighed about 160 pounds, so a tennis racket didn't seem like the best option, even if it would have felt good in the moment. With Franklin's clothes and shoes in hand, Max took one last look at his wife, the woman he had loved for over 20 years, the mother of his daughters, and hardened his heart against the love that had once defined him. He left the bedroom without shedding a tear, walked down the stairs and stepped outside. The key fob beeped, unlocking the Mercedes. Max placed his briefcase and duffel bag in the car, slid into the driver's seat, and started the engine. He'd never been a fan of flashy cars, but as he made his way through the bends, he had to admit he liked it. He figured out the controls, put the car in gear, and drove off. After about a mile, Max pulled over to examine Franklin's wallet. It contained the usual items, some cash, business cards, identifying Franklin Thompson as a senior sales manager at a local Mercedes dealership, and a driver's license showing a Charlotte address. Max considered that if Franklin had family in Charlotte, he could cause some serious trouble, not just for Franklin, but for Camilla too. But for now, Max was too drained to think clearly, so he headed to the nearest motel to get some sleep. Camilla Tronder was a cautious person. She wasn't as sharp as her husband Max, but her careful nature had helped her keep her affair with Franklin Thompson under wraps for nearly five months without Max ever suspecting. As she lay in bed with Franklin the next morning, she thought, he's good in bed. Not as good as Max, though. But out of bed? No comparison. Franklin was starting to act too possessively, though. He wanted to spend the night with her, and she let him. But she decided that would be the last time. She couldn't have a strange man in their bed, no matter how Max would never know. It just felt too disrespectful. She planned to call Franklin later that day and end the affair. After that, she headed for the shower. When she returned to the bedroom and started getting dressed, Franklin came out of the shower with a towel wrapped around his waist. He paused, then asked, Camilla, where did you put my clothes? What? Camilla replied. I didn't move anything. They were folded right here on this chair, Franklin said, but now they're gone. Did you take them to the guest room? They have to be here somewhere, he added, heading down the hallway. No, I didn't, Camilla said, now growing impatient. They're not there. Franklin came back quickly. Nothing there either, he said, his voice trailing off as he tried to make sense of the situation. Maybe you left them downstairs last night? No, I'm sure I didn't, Franklin said, now more confused. I'll go check downstairs. He hurried out of the room and came back up the stairs, panicked. Camilla! Camilla! he shouted. My car's gone! My clothes aren't downstairs. Someone was here last night, took my clothes, and stole my car. Damn it, he muttered, flustered. What's going on? Camilla asked, sounding bewildered. How could my clothes and car be gone? Franklin said, his mind racing. They'd been in the house all night. Could someone have gotten in? Camilla suddenly collapsed onto the bed. What? What? Franklin asked, kneeling beside her. Franklin, what if it was Max? She whispered, barely audible. What if he came home from New York while we were sleeping? What if he took your clothes in your car? Oh, crap, Franklin muttered, collapsing onto the bed beside her. You need to find out where he is. It could be him. But if he's still in New York, then it must have been a burglar, Camilla said, her thoughts racing. We need to call the police. I've got to get my stuff and my car back. Damn this car, Franklin muttered. If we call the police, they'll want to know who owns the car, he added, frustrated. It's in my wife's name for some damn tax reason. 
His voice trailed off as he imagined the worst-case scenario. I'll call his office. His secretary arrives early and she should know where he is. Camilla quickly grabbed her phone and dialed Max's office number, even though it wasn't yet 8 o'clock. Max Tronder's office, Sheila answered immediately. Hey, Sheila, it's Camilla, Camilla said. I know it's early and I'm not sure where Max is. He didn't call last night. Have you heard anything from him? Sheila hesitated before answering. Camilla, it's still early. I know the team in New York worked late yesterday, so they'll probably be starting late today. I talked to Max around six just before I left. He said they were making good progress and might finalize the deal today. That's good to hear, Camilla replied, feeling a little better. So he's still in New York, right? Yes, I'm sure of it, Sheila said. I expect to hear from him when they get back to the lawyer's office. Would you like me to have him call you? Yes, please, Camilla said, trying to sound calm. But only if he has time. I know how important this deal is. Got it, Sheila replied before ending the call. Take care. They hung up, and Camille turned to Franklin. Max is still in New York, so we should probably call emergency and report a break-in and car theft, she said, her voice unsure. Camille, what do we even tell them? Franklin asked, panic creeping into his voice. That your lover had his clothes stolen from your bedroom and his car stolen from your driveway? Seriously, what the hell? We're screwed here. Okay, okay, I get it. Camille said, trying to think clearly. Let's figure this out. How about I drive you home and you can change there? Then you can report the thefts, as if they happened while you were home, like maybe when your wife was out taking the kids to school. And we can skip reporting the clothes. Those might be harder to explain than a stolen car. Franklin paused. Well, I told my wife yesterday I was going to Atlanta for a meeting on the new Mercedes S-Class, and I wouldn't be home until noon. All right, Camille replied, considering the angle. We can wait until about noon when you'll be back home. You drove there, left your keys in the car because it was just a quick stop before going to the dealership and your car got stolen while you were there. Franklin's expression softened as he started to warm up to the idea. You know, that could actually work. And I could say I left my wallet in the car and that got stolen too. Yeah, Camille said, smiling slightly. And we can hang out here for a while? Maybe even need another shower? Maybe together? Franklin nodded and stood up from the bed. Okay, I'll need to call in sick to work. Camille worked as a paralegal at a small law firm. The work wasn't bad, just a little dull. She stepped into the hallway to make the call, then returned to find Franklin already back in bed. She was tempted, but as she thought about Max and her decision to end the affair, she decided against it. Franklin, she said, making no move to take off her clothes. I think it's time to end this. We had a good run, but, you know, it could have been Max last night. We're lucky it was just a burglar. Franklin looked at her, his mind racing. He wanted to convince her to keep going, but deep down he realized she was right. They had been lucky, but pushing their luck wasn't smart. Yeah, he said, inwardly smiling at the thought of another attractive woman he often saw at the dealership. Okay, I agree. It was a good run. Good, Camille said. Now let's find you some clothes. Finding clothes for Franklin proved trickier than expected. He was 50 pounds heavier and four inches taller than Max. After some searching, Camille finally found a pair of old, worn-out sweatpants that she could adjust to fit Franklin by making a few cuts at the waist. She tied some strings around his waist to keep them up and then found an old, faded sweatshirt that had turned pink after a sloppy wash. She trimmed the sleeves and cut more at the armholes to make it fit. She looked at Franklin and almost made a joke about the ridiculous outfit. But instead, she just smiled faintly when she saw the look on his face. They decided to watch TV until it was time to head to Franklin's house. Meanwhile, earlier that morning, when Franklin discovered his clothes and car were missing, Max was pulling into the driveway of the address listed on Franklin's driver's license. Nice house, Max thought as he noticed a small bicycle leaning against the garage wall. He sat in the car for a moment, deep in thought, but still no tears. His night at the motel had passed quickly, and he hadn't gone for a run until just before dawn. He was surprised he didn't feel worse. Maybe he was still in shock. He got out of the car, holding Franklin's wallet and driver's license, and walked to the front door. He rang the bell. A young woman, probably in her 20s, answered the door. She was attractive, but a little frazzled. Max held up Franklin's driver's license for her to see and pointed at the gold Mercedes in the driveway. Before he could say anything, she slammed the door in his face. A few seconds later, she reopened it, holding her cell phone. I've got emergency ready to dial, she said, her voice tense. Tell me my husband is okay or I will press send. Ma'am, Max said, his voice calm but firm. 
I've got a photo on my phone of your husband and my wife in bed last night, unclothed and asleep. To be honest, I don't think there's anything wrong with either of them. But if you want to call emergency, go ahead. I'll just wait in the car. They stood there for a long moment, staring at each other. The woman's face fell, and she slowly opened the door to let him in. She started to speak, but then they both heard a child's voice from the kitchen. Wait here, I'll be right back, she said, disappearing into the house. Max could hear voices, hers and at least one child's. She returned moments later holding a cup of coffee. I hope you drink it black, she said. I need to get the kids ready for school and drop them off. I'm afraid I trust you more than I trust my husband. Max nodded and took the coffee. Fine. Okay. She gestured to the couch. You can wait here until I get back, then we can talk. Max sat down, sipping the coffee, which wasn't great. He thought about calling his office, but ended up just sitting there. After a while, the woman returned, looking more put together. Her hair was neatly combed, and her lips were slightly tinted. She extended her hand to Max. Sorry for the disruption, she said. I'm Molly Thompson, married to Franklin Thompson, who's currently involved with your wife. Max couldn't help but laugh at her bluntness. It felt good to laugh. You're right about everything that's happening right now. I'm Max Tronder, and my wife's name is Camilla Tronder. Max explained what had happened the previous night, and as he spoke, he noticed Molly's eyes beginning to fill with tears. I'm divorcing Camilla, Max said, his tone calm and steady. I'm sure these photos will help me get a fair settlement. If you think they'll be useful, I can send them to your phone. Molly paused, her expression hardening. Yes, I think I should have them, she said, her voice flat. But don't send them to me. If I see them, I won't be able to forget those images. You keep them. If I need them, I'll call you, okay? Of course, Max replied. But I probably won't be at my current job for long, and I definitely won't be living in my current house anymore. I'll give you my lawyer's contact info. You can reach him if you need the photos or any help with a divorce. All right, thank you, Molly said. But what should we do right now? Are you planning to return the car or wait for Franklin and try to take him on? You've seen him. He's a pretty big guy, even though he's gained a little weight. Max thought for a moment. Yesterday he was supposed to be in Atlanta for a car meeting and stay overnight. He should be home this afternoon. Molly gave a small smile. You know, I actually like this car. I've never driven a Mercedes before. I think I'll keep it until someone makes me return it. Max grinned. Your husband, and I'm calling him a-hole, would probably be the one to force you to give it back. Molly laughed, and Max joined in. They both needed a laugh. Actually, Molly said, the car is registered in my name for some tax reasons. More depreciation. Franklin, or should I say a-hole, put it in my name since I drive more than he does. She paused, then added, You know, since I own the car, I can give you a permit to drive it, and the cops can call me to confirm if you get pulled over. Max liked the idea but stayed quiet as Molly worked through her plan. And one more thing, she continued. There have been a lot of break-ins in our neighborhood lately. You've got Franklin's keys and clothes. If the spare key we've hidden in the backyard is missing when he gets home, he might try to break in. And if our security system's in instant alert mode, he'll definitely attract some police attention. Max raised an eyebrow. Molly, I think I'm falling in love again. You're brilliant. All right, all right she said with a smile. Franklin can just wait until the kids and I get back from school this afternoon. I can pick them up and take them to the park. That should give him plenty of time to get himself into even more trouble. Whatever happens, let me know. Especially if he gets into trouble with the cops. And call me when you need your car back. I don't want you getting into any trouble. We're done now, Molly said, standing up. You need to get going, and so do I. Max drove off in the shiny gold Mercedes, wondering how much a better colored version would cost. Molly handed him the permit, and he assumed she'd take care of the rest. Meanwhile, around noon, Camille dropped Franklin off at his house. She hurried away, eager to distance herself from the mess. Franklin walked up to his front door, hoping it wouldn't be locked, but also worried that Molly might be there. Of course, it was locked. He rushed around to the backyard rock where they kept the spare key, but the rock was gone he muttered, staring at the back of the house. Should he break in? He tried the back door, but it was locked, too. At this point, he had no choice but to break in. He eyed the windows along the back wall. Which one would be easiest to break? He stopped at the largest one, the one leading into the family room. Breaking it would give him more room to crawl through. He grabbed a branch from a nearby tree, broke it off, 
and checked the window. Barefoot, he needed to figure out how to avoid stepping on broken glass. He pulled two chairs from the back porch, positioned them near the window, and figured he could climb over them to avoid the glass. A few deep breaths, and he was ready. Franklin threw the branch through the window. The glass shattered with a satisfying crash, followed immediately by the blaring sound of the home alarm. To make things worse, a police car just happened to be driving down Franklin Street. Molly had called the police station earlier that morning to report the recent break-ins in the area. Damn, 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 Franklin muttered, trying to scramble over the chairs and get inside to disable the security system. But he wasn't fast enough. Police, stop right there and raise your hands, a voice shouted behind him. Franklin turned to see two police officers with their tools drawn. He hesitated, then carefully climbed off the chairs and backed away. Officers, I can explain, he began, but one of the officers grabbed his wrists, twisted them behind his back, and handcuffed him. The officer ignored Franklin's explanation and began reading him his rights. Once he finished, he asked, Do you want to say anything? Yes, yes, Franklin quickly responded. This is my house. I don't have a key. I broke in to get some clothes and call my office. The officers exchanged a glance, eyeing Franklin's ridiculous tracksuit. One of them gave him a skeptical look, as if thinking clown clothes, before asking, Do you have any identification? Uh, no. No, not right now, Franklin stammered. I lost my car and all my stuff. I just need to get inside to grab some real clothes. The officer, still unconvinced, asked, How did you lose your car, sir? Well, Franklin said, I stayed at a friend's house last night, and this morning my car was gone, just wasn't there. Huh, one of the officers replied. Have you filed a report about a missing car? Maybe you left it at a bar or something? Franklin hesitated. He didn't want to reveal where he'd been or why he hadn't reported the car missing. The handcuffs were pinching, and he was growing more anxious. He needed a way out. Then, a thought struck him. You can call my wife, Franklin suggested. She can identify me, and maybe you can take me to my office. I can get someone there to help me with some clothes. He figured dealing with a bit of nonsense at the dealership was better than getting thrown in jail. One of the officers took down Molly's phone number and stepped away to make the call. Franklin could hear part of the conversation. Ma'am, this is Officer Riles from the Charlotte Police Department, the officer said. We're at the address. He gave the address. And we've got a man here who claims to be your husband. He tried to break into your house because he lost his clothes and... Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We'll take care of that. Thank you, ma'am. The officer turned back to Franklin. She says her husband's in Atlanta and anyone breaking into her house must be a burglar. She hopes we lock you up and throw away the key. But... But... Franklin's voice cracked, nearly in tears, as the officers led him to their patrol car to take him to the station. Meanwhile, Camille arrived late at her office, but was determined to catch up on her work, her mind still on Max. Since she hadn't heard from him, she called his cell phone, but there was no answer. She then tried his office. Hello, Sheila, Camille said when the phone was answered. Camille, it's Sheila, came the reply. I'm starting to worry a little about Max, Camille admitted. I still haven't heard from him. No, I haven't heard anything new either, Sheila responded. I guess he's still in New York with the lawyers, but it's really not like him to not call. You seem worried, so I'll call there and check on him, Camille said. Either he or I will get back to you in a few minutes. Okay, thank you, Sheila. You're the best secretary I could ask for, Camille added sincerely. A few minutes later, Camille received a return call. Camille, it's Sheila, came the voice on the other end. I spoke with one of the secretaries at the law office. She said Max left late yesterday, hoping to catch the last flight back to Charlotte. Did you talk to him? Camille asked, her voice rising with hope. I called Max on his cell to check in, Sheila explained. I spoke to him and he asked me to tell you he would call later. All right, thank you, Sheila, Camille replied, relieved but still anxious. You're welcome, Camille, Sheila said before disconnecting. A tight knot began to form in the pit of Camille's stomach. Max had hung up after speaking to Sheila. He was now driving a gold Mercedes headed to meet with a divorce lawyer recommended by Fred Thomas, his longtime business attorney. Max trusted Fred and hoped he could also trust Fred's recommendation. Mr. Thronder, please take a seat. Miss Reinhardt will be with you shortly, the receptionist said. Max sat down, reassured by the office's appearance. It wasn't extravagant, but it wasn't shabby either. Before he could dwell on it, a woman in her fifties, a little plump with obviously dyed red hair, entered the waiting room. Mr. Thronder? Max stood and nodded. 
I'm Anna Reinhardt, she said. Fred called ahead and asked me to take the best care of you. Let's go into my office and discuss your situation. Max followed her into a nice but not overly fancy office, where he grabbed a coffee from the secretary and began telling his story. He explained that he'd discovered his wife's infidelity, wanted a divorce, and needed to protect his assets, especially the proceeds from the sale of his company and his sister's business. He skipped over the part about the gold Mercedes, suspecting Anna might find it amusing. Max, is it okay if I call you that? She asked. He nodded. And I'm Anna. Here's the good news. Well, relatively speaking, she continued. Fred mentioned you and your sisters owned the company before you married your wife. That means your shares are considered separate property. Your wife has no claim to those shares or the proceeds from the sale, but you need to keep those funds separate from any joint accounts you have with her. Does that sound right? I think so, Max replied. But what about the house, the retirement accounts, and so on? He asked. Unfortunately, there's not such great news there, Anna said. Because your salary is higher than hers, you'll likely be paying child support for a few years. We can probably avoid contributing to the retirement accounts by increasing alimony. I know it's not ideal, but it's better than sharing your retirement funds decades down the road. And since your kids are in college, no child support for them. I assume you're okay covering the rest of their college expenses? Yes, that works, Max said, still processing the information. What about the house? Anna asked. You and your wife will need to decide what to do. You can sell it and split the proceeds, or one of you can buy out the other based on the current appraisal. After what happened last night, I definitely don't want that house, Max said firmly. I don't think Camilla can afford to buy my share, so I guess we'll sell. Okay, I'll handle the paperwork that way, Anna said. The divorce petition is pretty standard, so I can have it ready for you by tomorrow morning. We can serve it to her tomorrow afternoon and then work on a proposed settlement next week. Wow, that's fast, Max said, surprised. Mr. Thronder. Max, listen, Anna said, her tone softening. If you think there's a chance you and your wife might benefit from some counseling, or even just some time apart... No, Max interrupted, cutting her off. It's just a shock for me. Less than 24 hours ago, I was excited to get home and tell Camille the good news about selling the company. And now I'm sitting here talking about divorce. But we need to move forward. I'll figure out how to handle it. Anna paused, then spoke gently. Okay, but if you change your mind, just call me and we can work things out. Max thanked her, paid the retainer, and left the office. He walked back to the gold Mercedes, his mind drifting to that a-hole he'd encountered the previous night. The thought reminded him he had promised his secretary he would call Camilla. Camilla picked up the phone in her office at the law firm. Camilla, it's Max, he said. You called and were looking for me. Oh, Max, thanks for calling. I've missed you, she replied. You? Where are you? Max asked. I'm here in Charlotte, Camilla answered. When did you get back? She asked, her voice tensing slightly. Last night, Camilla. I came back last night. The feeling in her stomach tightened. Camilla leaned back in her chair, struggling to breathe, let alone speak. Camilla, I'm about to hang up, Max said. No, Max, please don't, she begged, her voice breaking. Can we meet somewhere? Just for a few minutes, please? Max hesitated. This was the woman he loved, the mother of his children, his partner for over 20 years. All right, Camille. The Center Cafe at six, he agreed, his voice thick with emotion. The knot in Camille's stomach twisted tighter. She knew she had to say yes. The Center Cafe. That's where we met years ago. Why am I afraid, she thought. Max suggested it, so I have to agree. Yes, Max. I'll see you there, she replied, her voice wavering. And softly she added, I'm sorry, I love you. Max didn't respond. He simply hung up. Camilla sat there, tears flowing, her chest tightening. She arrived at the cafe early, but Max wasn't there yet. She ordered a glass of wine and sat, reflecting on what a terrible person she had become. Her first real experiences were with college football players, big, strong men who made her feel helpless. She'd played around in high school, but it was in college that the physicality of it all left a mark on her. When she met Max, she thought those days were behind her. He was everything she needed, strong, loving, a great father, and a provider. That should have been enough. But then came the flight back to Charlotte after a weekend trip to the West Coast. Max had been meeting with a pharmaceutical company while she tagged along. Flying home alone on the overnight flight, she ended up seated next to a large man, an NFL coach. They drank, talked, 
and she fell asleep with her head on his shoulder. She woke up to find his hand between her legs under her skirt. Now, thinking back on it, she knew she should have screamed or at least pushed him away. But she didn't. Guilt welled up inside her. Camille had always wanted to remain faithful to Max. She had ended things with her lover, convinced herself she was done with cheating when the girls went off to college. She cherished her time with Max, their bond now stronger than ever. But the snake inside her came back when Max did something nice for her. He told her it was time to get a new car, one she should pick for herself. It felt like a gift. And that's when she met Franklin Thompson at the Mercedes dealership. He didn't sell her a car, but he knew exactly how to manipulate her. He seduced her into bed. And though she knew it was wrong, it still happened. Not because Franklin was good in bed, but because she was betraying Max. She had gotten away with previous affairs, convincing herself the marriage was intact. But now, with Max, everything was different. They were closer than ever, and Camille was determined to stay faithful. She didn't want to make the same mistake again, especially with someone like Franklin, who in the end seemed like nothing more than an idiot. But she had let him in. And now, she feared the consequences she might have to face. Hello, Camilla. Max's voice interrupted her thoughts. She looked up and saw him standing there. He seemed older, more tired than before the trip. It hit her hard. It was her fault. Her stomach churned with guilt. Hi, Max, she whispered. Thank you for being here. I don't even know where to start. I'm so, so sorry. Max sat down across from her. Can I ask you a few questions? Oh, Max, please don't, she said, her voice frantic. If we have any chance at all, the questions will just destroy it. Please, we can't do this. But Max was firm. Camilla... We have to face this. If you can't answer my questions, I'm leaving right now. The snake inside her coiled tighter. Camille knew she had to endure this confrontation. Maybe, just maybe, if Max could express his pain, there was a chance to reconcile. Okay, Max, ask me anything. Max didn't hesitate. Do you know what time I got home last night? Camilla blinked, caught off guard by the question. Um, no, not exactly. She had no idea what he would ask next, but as soon as the words left her mouth, she realized what was coming. And do you know what I saw when I went upstairs to our bedroom, or should I say, what I saw in our bedroom, or maybe what used to be our bedroom? Max's voice was sharp, cutting through the air. Yes, Max, I know what you must have seen, Camilla said, her voice shaking. And I know it was probably one of the worst things you've ever seen in your life. I know it's all my fault. Please, I'm begging you, listen to me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Max didn't respond immediately, but his eyes darkened with a depth of emotion Camilla had never seen before. His next words were colder than ice. Shut up, Camilla, he said, cutting through her apologies with a sharp edge to his voice. Next question. How many men have there been since we got married? And if you lie, or if I even think you're lying, I'll get up and leave. Got it? The pressure of his question hit Camilla like a physical weight, crushing her chest. Her mind raced torn between the urge to lie and the painful truth that lying would only make everything worse. Their marriage was probably already over. Three Max. Three men, she said, each word feeling like a stone sinking deep inside her. Three men, and I regret every single one of them. Max stared at her for a long moment. She could see the hurt in his eyes, and it felt like a knife twisting in her gut. I can see it in your eyes, he said quietly. I think our marriage is over and I understand it. You deserve better than me. I'd do almost anything to fix things, but I get it if you don't want me anymore. Camilla's world seemed to crumble in an instant. She had no words left to say. She knew what was coming. Call the lawyer, Camilla, Max continued, his voice a mix of pain and resolve. Tomorrow you'll be served with divorce papers. Without another word, Max stood up and walked out. Camilla sat there frozen in shock, too stunned to cry at first, her mind replayed his words over and over. The guilt inside her gnawed harder than ever. Finally, the tears came. Tears of regret, of pain, and of knowing the full weight of what she had done. Max left the cafe, remembering how he and Camilla had first met there years ago. He wondered if this would be the last time they ever had a meaningful conversation, or any real connection. The word closeness felt like a bitter joke now. How could he ever move past the image of his wife, his Camilla, in bed with another man? He had always believed their marriage was strong enough to weather anything. But this, this was something he didn't know how to overcome. Franklin, of all people. And to make it worse, it had happened in their own bed. The image wouldn't leave his mind. Camilla, unclothed in their bed, 
with Franklin snoring beside her. Max tried to push it away, but it clung to him, gnawing at him, reminding him their marriage was over. It had to be. Max's eyes filled with tears as he sat behind the wheel of the gold Mercedes. He didn't know how to move forward from here. He wiped his eyes, feeling a mixture of grief and disbelief. Then he remembered something Molly had said earlier that morning. She had warned him not to send her photos of her husband with Camilla. It will make it even harder to forgive, she had said. Max realized she had been right. Seeing those pictures would have made any chance of reconciliation impossible. Max picked up his phone and dialed Molly's number. Hello? Molly answered, her voice a bit hoarse. Molly, it's Max. I just wanted to check in, see how you're doing and what I should do with the car. Max, thank you for calling, Molly replied, her voice steady but tinged with fatigue. I'm hanging in there. You can keep the car for now. Franklin's in so much trouble, he won't need it for a while. Trouble? Max asked, his tone light but lacking any real humor. I hope you didn't shoot him. No, Molly said dryly, but he might wish I had. He got arrested for trying to break into our house. Apparently, he even swung at one of the cops. He's a big guy, so they shot him with a taser. Then something happened in jail. He won't talk about it, but I think another prisoner attacked him. I wouldn't talk to him about it, though, and he had to call his brother to post bail. His whole family knows now. Wow, Molly, Max said, shaking his head in disbelief. I can't say I feel bad for him, but I do feel for you. You made the right call this morning not to look at those pictures. If you had, there'd be no hope for reconciliation. Yeah, Molly sighed. He finally came home a couple of hours ago, crying, begging me to let him stay. I don't know what to do. We've got two little kids, so I'm just trying to figure things out. Life won't be easy for him. His brother, who's a lawyer, told me I should push for a prenuptial agreement, and he said he'd help with that. For now, I'm taking control of the finances. Franklin's on a very short leash. Keep doing what you need to do, Molly. I wish you the best, Max said with genuine empathy. And whenever you're ready to return the car, just let me know. They hung up. Max sat there for a moment, feeling a strange mix of jealousy and relief. Maybe Franklin had learned his lesson. His arrest, the attack charge, and whatever had happened to him in prison might have scared him enough to change. Max hoped so, for Molly's sake, and for her kids. Max drove back to his motel, his mind still reeling from the chaos of the past few hours. He knew he had one more call to make before he could attempt to sleep. His daughters, Jane and Joan. Hi, Daddy, Jane answered after a few rings, her voice bright but slightly unsure. Hey, Janie, Max said, trying to sound upbeat. I wanted to invite you and Joan to breakfast tomorrow. Well, let's call it brunch. How about around 11? The bistro on 4th Street we used to go to. That sounds good, Jane replied, her tone warming. Let me check with Joan. A few moments later, Jane came back on the line. Joan's fine with it. We'll see you tomorrow at 11. Max quickly ended the call. Great. See you then. Love you both. He hung up, hoping they wouldn't tell Camilla. But he couldn't stop them from speaking their minds. 11 a.m. was coming fast. Meanwhile, Camilla couldn't stop crying. She had destroyed everything. Her marriage, her family, her life. She knew it wouldn't be long before her daughters found out, or her parents, or her friends. She would lose it all. And Max? Poor Max. Seeing her in bed with Franklin had to have torn him apart. She was sure of it. Camilla tried to control her sobs. The waitress asked if she needed to use the restroom, but Camilla declined. She paid the bill with trembling hands and left the cafe. She walked home, well, to the house that would soon no longer be hers, and found a bottle of gin in the kitchen. She poured herself a little. Not enough to forget, just enough to numb the pain. She drank it all, hoping, praying for a miracle that might somehow bring Max back. The next morning, Max was already at the bistro when Jane and Joan arrived. Max had reviewed and approved the draft of the divorce petition earlier in the morning, then drove two hours from Charlotte, using the time to figure out what to say to Jane and Joan. But first, as always, there were hugs and kisses. How's school? How's work? They asked. They ordered food, ate together, and cleared the plates. Then finally, the real conversation began. Dad, we know something's wrong, Joan said, her voice full of concern and curiosity. You look sick. Are you here to tell us you have cancer or something? And if so, where's mom? Girls, yes, I've got some really bad news, but it's nothing physical. No one's dying, Max said, trying to soften the blow. Jane interrupted before he could continue. Oh my God, did she run off with one of her firm's lawyers? A young, hot body that Joni or I should be chasing? 
Both girls burst into laughter, shocked by the absurdity of the idea. But when they looked at their father, they saw he wasn't laughing. No, no, not mom. Joan's face fell and her voice caught. No. She couldn't even finish the thought, too afraid to put the words out loud. Girls, listen carefully, Max said, his voice steady. Yes, mom changed. She cheated on me. But that doesn't mean she cheated on you. Yes, that's right. Daddy, Joan said through her tears. If her cheating is destroying our family, then she cheated on us just as much as she did on you. Both girls cried and Max's tears followed, falling freely. The girls stood up to hug him, then each other, all of them clinging together. Dad, let's get out of here, Jane said, her voice thick with emotion. There's a park about two blocks from here. We'll have more privacy there. People were staring, so Max quickly paid the bill, and they walked to the park, one girl on each side of him. They found a bench and sat together, huddled close. Tell us, Dad, Jane said after a few moments. We deserve to know how bad it is. Joan nodded. You know, we're adults now. We can handle this. Max took a deep breath. On the way here, I was trying to figure out what to tell you. I agree. You're both adults, and yes, you're right. Your mom did cheat on all of us. I found her in our bed with another man, and she admitted there were others before him. He paused, his words heavy with the truth. I'm still in shock, but I know she and I won't recover from this. I've already spoken to a divorce lawyer, and Mom will be served with the papers today. More tears fell, and silence fell over them as they processed the devastating news and what it meant for their future. Girls, Max said after a moment, his voice gentler, no matter how bad this gets, you need to put yourselves and your schoolwork first. There's enough money to cover your senior year at Duke, and if either or both of you want to go to grad school, I'll make it happen too. They looked at him, confused by the sudden change in direction. But there's a catch, Max added. They blinked. What do you mean? Joan asked. I'm happy to pay for your education, Max said, but I expect you to work hard and get good grades. Yes, I know what mom did makes it harder to focus on school, but you told me you're adults now and real adults mature, disciplined people, can handle adversity, right? The girls looked at each other, both crying again, but then they stood up and hugged him, tight. Yes, yes, Daddy, Joan said through her tears. You're the best, and we absolutely positively won't let you down. Jane, still emotional, looked thoughtful. Dad, Joan's right, we won't let you down. But what about you? Are you going to be okay? What will you do? Max thought for a moment. Well, you think a lot during a two-hour drive he said, trying to lighten the mood. First, I want you both to know that what you said doesn't surprise me at all. I know you'll keep doing great in school and I'll keep being proud of you. As for me, what your mom did really hit me hard. I could crawl into a hole and just suffer, feel sorry for myself, try to make peace with her. But I realized that isn't who I am. He smiled, but it was a smile that barely reached his eyes. I've spent my whole adult life taking care of others. When I worked for my grandparents' company, I took care of them. After they left, I took care of my sisters when they ran the business. Then I took care of mom, and of you girls. Max paused and wiped his eyes. It might sound like I'm complaining, but I'm really not. The company will be sold soon, and that will lift the burden of responsibility for my sisters off me. Camilla left, and you too. Well, I promise I'll gladly take care of you, help you start your adult lives. So what? Two home runs out of three, not bad at all, considering the women in my life. The girls watched him, confused, but also a little inspired. That leaves me, Max continued, his eyes brightening. And guess what? I'm looking at this whole mess of betrayal and divorce not as the worst thing to happen to me, but as an opportunity to start fresh. A whole new life. A life dedicated to one person, me. Okay, Dad, really, Joan said. I mean, if you mean it, that's great. Jane was a little more skeptical. Dad, what does all this even mean? A new life? Work for another pharmaceutical company? Are you buying a farm? What's going on? Max chuckled. Good question. And I've got a great answer. No details yet, but this new life will be physical. I'm going to run marathons, climb mountains, swim across the Atlantic, hike the Alps, go on safari. I have a million things I plan to do. He looked at both girls, his eyes sparkling. And who knows? While I'm doing all that, I might meet a nice woman who's doing the same. Who knows? Damn, Dad, Joan said, her voice filled with awe. This... This is amazing. Both girls stared at him, their mouths agape in shock. This was their father. This wasn't the man they had known. Did you really come up with all this on the drive here from Charlotte? Jane asked, astonished. Max smiled, a bit sheepish. Well, yes, partly. 
But besides that, I didn't sleep much, and a lot of different ideas were spinning around in my head. I could start drinking and feel sorry for myself, but instead, I'm going to make the best of this mess. Trust me, I'll be fine. Max left with more hugs, kisses, and tears, then headed back to Charlotte in the gold Mercedes. As soon as Max left, the girls called their mother. Hello? Camilla's tired voice answered the phone at the Tronder's house. Joan put her phone on speaker. Mom, it's Joan and Jane. We just had breakfast with Dad and he told us some terrible news. What? What did he say? Camilla's voice was sharp with concern. Well, Joan began carefully. Divorce is a terrible word, and the reason is your betrayal. Dad gave us more details, but that's basically it. Is this true? There was a long pause, then a soft, tormented sigh from the other end of the line. Oh, girls, Camilla said, her voice breaking. This is difficult. Your father and I have been married for so long, and this... this mistake... Yes, I made a big mistake. Well, more than one, actually, but I'm sure we can work through it. I just need to give your father some time. Mom, Joan interrupted, trying to stay calm. Listen, Dad said divorce. He didn't talk about fixing anything. He was talking about cheating. Camilla hesitated. Well, yes, technically he's right, but that doesn't mean we can't fix it. Jane's voice came through quickly, sharp with frustration. I think you're delusional. He told us he already met with a divorce lawyer. He said there's no going back for you two. Joan spoke more gently. We don't want to take sides, but you need to face reality. More silence followed. Then Camilla's voice broke through again, barely a whisper. I know, I know, I know. I messed up and ruined my marriage. I think your father hates me, and he's right. I've done disgusting things. He told me to hire a lawyer, and he was right about that, too. I'm sorry, girls. Joan spoke softly, trying to offer comfort. We know it's tough for you, too, Mom. Don't worry about us. We'll be okay. I know Dad is doing everything he can. You need to take care of yourself. Hiring a lawyer sounds like a good idea. Jane added, her tone more practical. Jane and I can go to Charlotte if you need us. Thank you, girls. That's sweet, Camilla said, her voice thick with emotion. I'll be fine. I just need some time to come to terms with what I've done. They hung up. The girls were still unsure what to do next. You know, Joan said with a bittersweet smile. It's funny. Although it's really not. But we're more worried about Mom, who created all this mess, than about Dad. They talked a bit longer eventually deciding not to go home but to let their parents deal with everything on their own. Meanwhile, Camilla sat at home in Charlotte, nursing a hangover from the gin she had drunk the night before and feeling even worse after her conversation with her daughters. She knew she needed to get up, get dressed, and leave the house. Do something, she told herself. But as she thought about buying more gin, the doorbell rang. Camilla opened the door to find a young woman standing on the doorstep chewing gum. Can I help you? Camilla asked a note of confusion in her voice. Yes, ma'am, the woman said, popping her gum. Are you Camilla Tronder, Max Tronder's wife? Yes, that's me, Camilla replied, her brow furrowing. Why do you ask? You've been served, the woman said, handing Camilla a folder of documents and taking pictures. What? What's this? Camilla asked, but the woman was already walking back to her car. Shaking, Camilla returned inside and sat down at the kitchen table, staring at the folder. When she saw the title of the first document, her heart dropped. A petition for divorce. She remembered Max's final words, get a lawyer. Sitting there in the kitchen surrounded by the remnants of happier times, she knew those days were gone. She'd ruined everything. There was no going back. Six years later, as she sat in the ballroom of an upscale hotel watching Jane dance with her new husband, Camilla's mind drifted back to the past. Back when the girls were teenagers, she had thought life was overwhelming. Too many activities, too much teenage angst, and too many boys who were either too rude or, from Camilla's point of view, too kind to the girls. Max had been too busy with his assistant job, and the lawyer work had been too dull. Life had seemed so chaotic then, but now she longed for those days. She was still working at the same law firm, buried in the same paperwork she'd always dreamed of escaping. Camilla, here's your wine, Carl, her companion said, handing her a glass. Camilla looked up at him. He was sweet, middle-aged, a little paunchy, and balding. He'd come with her to Jane's wedding and reception. The bride looks lovely, Carl said with a smile, just like her mother. Thank you, Carl, Camilla replied warmly, her eyes softening. You're very kind, and thanks for the wine. He was a nice guy, and she could see herself marrying him if he was interested, but he definitely wasn't. Her eyes drifted across the room to Max, 
He had just returned from a mountaineering trip in Nepal, and she couldn't help but notice how incredibly fit he had become. He looked like one of those Greek statues, tanned, muscular, and still handsome as ever. He was laughing with Joan and her boyfriend, holding hands with a woman as beautiful and fit as Max. Camilla felt a pang in her chest. She knew Max had moved on, but a part of her still longed for what they had lost. Joan had told Camilla that Max had met the woman on another mountaineering trip in South America, and that they had been traveling, climbing, and sailing together for months. Camilla felt sick just thinking about it. Camilla, Carl said, gently trying to get her attention. Yes, Carl, she replied, distracted, her mind still reeling. Camilla, I think we should leave, Carl suggested, his voice calm but firm. You've done your duty as mother of the bride. Staying here, staring at your ex-husband, isn't helping you. And I dare say, it's not good for what we've got going either. Camilla paused, considering his words. You're right, Carl. You're sweet. Let me go say goodbye to my daughters and we'll head out. She walked over to her daughters, hugging and kissing them, wishing the newlyweds the best. Despite how difficult it was, she made a point to avoid Max and his too-perfect girlfriend. Max noticed Camilla leaving and, for a brief moment, felt a pang of sadness as he watched her go, the shared history between them still tugging at him. As he stood there, Joan turned to him and asked, Sorry, Dad, what did you say? Max blinked, pulled from his thoughts. What was that, Joni? Joan looked at him curiously. Do you remember that weird-looking gold Mercedes you were driving when you, Jane, and I had breakfast that day you visited us at Duke? What happened to that car? Ah, Joni, that's a whole story I won't bore you with, Max replied, shaking his head. Let's just say I borrowed that odd gold Mercedes from a friend and ended up giving it back to her. I think she sold it. It was really an unlucky car. Max turned to his friend, eager to talk about their next trip to the mountains, putting the car conversation behind him.